Okay, look, folks, good afternoon. Um, my computer's telling me it's 1.30. Uh, my watch is telling me it's 1.31, so I think it's good time uh, to get going on the webinar today. Um, listen, first and foremost, thank you very much. Um, people giving up an hour of their day to hear from the programme is, is always a bit humbling. Um, we really hope we can make a good use of your hour, um, especially when that hour's at lunchtime. Um, so I'll, I promise I'll try and, and do the decent thing and keep it all very, very interesting. Um, the style I'm going to take today is going to be pretty casual. I think that facilitates the most interesting conversation. Um, you know, I'd like this to feel much more like we're all sat around a table having a giant lunch together rather than sat in sort of stuffy formal proceedings. Um, you know, I think we'll have the, just the most enjoyable time that way. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes or so, hopefully less, and leave the rest of the time open for Q&A. Um, I presume most folks are familiar with the platform by now, working with Zoom, but just type questions into the Q&A box. Uh, I'll come on to those at the end. Um, if we do run out of time, which I hope we won't, but if we do run out of time at the end of this presentation, I'll share some contact details where you can send on further questions uh, to colleagues in our corporate comms team. Um, and we can also use that if there are any that I can't answer on the hoof today. I promise you I'll do my very level best, um, but there's always, uh, you know, always ones where I need to draw on the fantastic body of resource we've got within the authority. Uh, the other thank you I'd like to offer today is to UK AEA's corporate comms team. Um, facilitating events like this, um, getting everything ready, getting everything set up, really is a huge amount of work on their part. They, they really do throw themselves into it and, and I'd like to thank them for giving me the chance to speak with all of you um, today. Uh, so before I do anything else, I'll introduce myself. My name is Tris Denton. I'm the Head of Commercial and Programme Development for STEP. Um, I'm trying to break that job title down so you can understand where I'm coming from, what I'm doing. I like to summarise, I'm doing everything except designing a tokamak. Um, it's sometimes helpful to say my degree is in politics and I've already seen on the chat that there's folks here with far more technical engineering fusion qualifications than I am. So I'm not gonna try and teach you all about the detail of uh, the inner workings of a spherical tokamak. What I hope I can do and what I hope is interesting is to talk a bit about the programme we have to deliver um, across the full scope, the programme working with stakeholders, working with industry, working with academia, um, working with government, working with regulators, um, seeking to bring forward a really credible programme, not just design the equipment, but bring forward a full scale spherical tokamak for energy production. Um, and I hope I can cover that in the next few minutes. The other thing I wanna do while I'm on the title slide, and, and I don't know if this is normal at these webinars or not, is when we're working in STEP in our meetings, we tend to start sessions with a safety or well-being or culture um, moment. Just take a moment to reflect on, on how we're all doing and what we all need. Um, obviously, in, um, uh, in normal times, I'd be telling you, please turn off your phone and here's the fire exits. I can't do that. What I can say is one of the things we've been looking at lately as we start meetings is just being aware that current working arrangements can be tough. Um, for all sorts of different reasons. Some people are finding it lonely. Some people haven't got a great space to work. Um, and what we're certainly trying to do is just look out for our teammates, look out for our mates, um, make sure we're all okay, keep an eye on the people we're working with around us. So just take a moment here. Um, I hope everyone on this call is doing okay. Um, and, you know, let's look after one another while we're working in slightly unusual ways. Okay, so this webinar is gonna be recorded. Um, you're all wonderfully invisible, I can't see you. Uh, the recording can't see you, it can see me, uh, and it will be shared on our YouTube platform. The question and answer function doesn't show on that recording, so please do feel free still to answer me questions, uh, ask me questions, sorry, um, as you usually would. Okay. I can click the slides forward. So Fusion, like I say, there's people on this call who will understand the detail of this far better than I, but let me give you a non-technical perspective on the challenge we face um, as a fusion industry and as a step program. We all know fusion can happen. Okay. The sun wouldn't work if it didn't. So confident fusion is real. We all know fusion can be achieved on planet Earth. It happens somewhere over my right shoulder here in Cullum, in Jet, a fantastic piece of equipment. And I come from a fission background initially. I've only been working in fusion uh, for 18 months or so. And I can tell you when I first visited Cullum and looked at Jet, it is awe-inspiring. It's fantastic. The story it tells is incredible. Uh, and as a sector, um, 
I think we should never lose that. And I hope all the folks listening to this who aren't part of the sector uh, will share that view and increasingly be captured by the excitement and the possibilities that this offers. The challenge, of course, is to harness fusion as a useful, deployable, commercially viable source of energy for humanity. That's why when we talk about STEP, the spherical tokamak for energy production, we've named that advisedly. We really are focused. This plant must deliver net energy, be an effective demonstration prototype to pave the way for successive fusion plant on the grid here and elsewhere. Introduction to STEP. So as I say, with a spherical tokamak for energy production program with a mission to design a commercially viable compact fusion reactor, collaborating with partners to build a UK prototype by 2040. It's a very clear mission. It's a very ambitious mission. It's a very exciting mission. This needs to be inherently a collaborative program. I don't believe as I look at the UK industry, the global industry, that there's anyone who can do this on their own. Now, whether that's in a supply chain mechanism, a collaboration mechanism, partnerships, we're going to need to work with others throughout this program be they in academia, supply chain, innovative sectors, established sectors, this will always be a collaborative endeavor. And that will extend once we come to the, to, to the infrastructure side of things. I'll talk more on that in a moment. That will extend to working with our host communities, communities all over the country, um, and engaging them in that exciting, challenging vision of bringing forward the program. The program structured in three tranches, as is traditional for programs of this scale. In these first five years, we're very focused on bringing forward a concept design, undertaking a site selection where we will build the tokamak, and looking at the future model of the program. In tranche two, we expect to deliver the full engineering design of that, and of course, deliver the swathe of infrastructure planning activities that I'll say more about in just a moment, to enable us in 2032 to begin a construction phase that will see the step machine completed by 2040. 21 years. 21 years, I think, can seem like a long time. Of course, it can seem like a long time. It is a long time in any of our lives. But in infrastructure terms, this is a tight, concise schedule. We have to make sure we focus, we bring forward work as far as we can, and we deliver the programme in the right way, for the right cost, on schedule. And if we do that, if we achieve our goal, it positions the UK, not just UK, the UK, to design and deliver a global fleet of commercial reactors in the second half of this century. And I'll talk a bit more in a moment about policy drivers for that and for fusion to play a role in not just a global electricity mix, but in a global energy mix. Now I say all this like it's easy. Of course, there are huge, huge challenges we must overcome. I was talking to somebody the other day uh, and they sort of nudged me and said, well, why don't you just get on and do it? And my answer was, look at everything fusion offers. Look at all the opportunities we have here. If it was easy, we'd already be doing it. There are serious R&D and design challenges that we must overcome. Indeed, the programme is about overcoming those and bringing forward this product to the market. Alongside all those, there's large-scale infrastructure development activities. Even with known, proven, well-understood technologies, delivering nationally significant infrastructure pro projects uh, is costly. Uh, 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 brings all sorts of challenges with it, uh, risks with it. We need to undertake those as we design the product. And of course, cost reduction, commercial viability. We want to bring this market, this product to market at the right point in the right way. I'd like to share a slide here, which we in fact wrote talking to supply chain a while ago, talking to suppliers about how exciting the fusion sector was. And I'm sure there's a couple of supply chain uh, colleagues on, on this call now. One of the great things about this meeting, in fact, was, was seeing um, uh, the breadth of people who, who, who could, could attend. And suppliers asked me, well, why should we take the risk? Why should we focus our slim business development resource on you, on fusion, on, on step? Why should we take you seriously? And my answer is in this list of bullet points that I'm not going to go through one by one, but I think show the credibility of the sector, of the technology, that piece by piece, challenge by challenge, this sector has proven its viability. It's getting increasingly close to showing that we can bring forward the products which we need to bring forward. Whether that's in the work we've done on MAST, whether that's the work that's been done globally to bring forward ITER, 
whether that's remote access in race, materials research, digital design, all of these factors enable success. And in doing that, they enable credibility to our programme. To look at digital design, for example, it's far faster, far easier, far less costly to model designs now than it would have been 20, 25 years ago. That's a material change. We need to look also, of course, at policy. The scale of need to remove carbon from our global economy. I don't think this has ever been clearer, and I don't think it needs me to say very much more on it now. I think the old phrase, well, that old, in fact, but the well-trodden phrase of, of act as if your house is on fire because it is, sums that up better than I could. We have to look at the post-2050 need as well. Net zero is a critical goal, but net zero doesn't sustain unless we keep bringing forward low carbon technologies. As global living standards rise, global energy demand rises, and potentially electricity as a proportion of energy rises, we will need secure, stable, reliable supplies in the second half of this century uh, for low carbon energy and electricity. And I believe this is where fusion has a vital role. And of course, the approach of the, the sector, the increasing focus on design-driven work, moving from R&D toward delivery. And look, I want to just sort of step back from our own program here and reflect for a moment that STEP is by no means alone. STEP is not the project that does this. This STEP is, is one of a number of very, very important projects. And the UK has wonderful fusion capabilities. You look at Tokamak Energy, you look at First Light Fusion, you look right across the supply chain. You look at the British contribution to ETA, which is incredible. The UK has a strong, capable and vibrant industry, which is going to be vital supporting us, and it's going to be vital to delivering wider projects. And there are other countries working on spherical tokamaks, as well as a range of collaborative international programs on fusion. Steps it's alongside these programs. And in doing so, we support the growth of a burgeoning high value, high impact UK industry. In what way? We believe a national full scope tokamak design program drawing together all the aspects of the authority and of the supply chain is a real win. And if you look at the drawing together, the capabilities of the authority, in my slide a moment ago, I talked about remote access, materials research, component design. It's when we bring these capabilities together into a product design, a tokamak design capability, we can really hope to bring forward a product, a product to market. And by bringing you product to market, you bring the product to use, to effect, to deliver the low carbon energy. And this is what we mean when we talk about going from an R&D to a delivery focused sector. That's not to downplay the challenges that remain, I've been clear on those and I, I won't say anything against them, but we have to focus on that journey from the lab to the street. Step further is ongoing innovation, as well as industrialization in the sector. And I think importantly, again, if the suppliers on this call, Step provides an increased client base against which skills and supply chain can be developed. It allows the sector and the industry to grow, confident they've got multiple clients, multiple opportunities, it provides that basis, that business case for growth of a private sector in the UK and beyond. And of course, STEP helps sustain the UK's strategic position as a leader in the field. Commercial vision, what does commercially viable mean? Well, look, I'm really clear on this. I think we need to be credible and we need to partners to have sufficient confidence to work with us in tranche two and beyond. We need to be an attractive prospect to suppliers, to partners, to collaborators. And in the longer term, future plant must come to market at a price point which enables deployment within energy systems. Just as I was kicking off, I noticed a question landing in the Q&A about do you believe fusion could ever break even? I think we have to believe fusion can break even. And I think we have to be committed to realizing that. Because if we don't, the country, the region, the world is going to face the challenges of global climate change and the need for energy supplies without this fantastic tool. If we can't bring that reality forward, we cannot put this tool in the toolbox to take on the challenges we all face. What's the end game market? We're well, quite open. Yes, of course, a gigawatt scale power station is one brilliant option of what you could do with this, but you shouldn't forget the other uses. Hydrogen, desalination, district heating, many, many things. We need to understand them, we need to explore them, we need to look at what our product could provide uh, to customers and to people. 
colleagues in the authority use a fantastic phrase when they talk about schedulable, schedulable heat and power. We need schedulable heat and power. When I worked in fission, we used to talk about our power plant as kettles. It's a very complicated kettle. It's a kettle with, in that case, very high risk. But it needs to produce steam in a reliable, controlled, predictable way. And that steam can spin a turbine or produce a range of other uses. We envisage a phrase, I've, I've used a horrible phrase here that colleagues can sneer at me for later, nth for kind, NOAC. This is when you have a fleet approach, multiple power stations coming off, each one bringing efficiencies, learnings, improvements, enhancements, going into multiple markets for multiple uses. And of course, what does fusion contribute? Clean, safe, sustainable, large scale power and energy. This slide means a lot to me, and it's one that I was talking to colleagues about yesterday evening as we, as we looked to bring this presentation together. People. Ultimately, all of what we're doing is about people. All of our success will be built on people. Anything we get wrong might well be because we don't get the right people. Our team now has a predominance of fusion researchers and engineers, rightly so, because it's a fusion research and design engineering task. We cross right across the fusion discipline. One of the exciting things about being at UKA is that breadth of knowledge, the breadth of capability that we can draw on, that we can reach into as a programme and get experts in their fields to help us understand and overcome these challenges. We've also got an emerging programme and infrastructure delivery capability we need to develop. This is not just about designing a product, it's about bringing a programme forward. And of course, the far wider set of corporate skills and capabilities which we need to run, administer, and deliver a program on this scale. Skills will increasingly need, I mean, I've grabbed four here because I could have flooded 10 slides with skills we'll need, but systems and design engineering. Manufacturing, there's no point designing something if it can't be made. Construction, we will need to build, to plan to build, and to build at the right cost, this plant. And of course, major program delivery, bringing together permissions, consents, regulatory consents, supply chain, skills, capabilities, our own work to bring forward a project where we design, permission, build, and then operate this facility. Talent development, success will be delivered by people. We need to attract and nurture talent. There's a crucial role in that for academia and partnerships and a vital contribution from industry. All the talent on the programme does not need to be in the authority. We're already working with wonderful suppliers across the country and beyond who help us by bringing niche expertise or bringing capacity. All of those roles are vital to our success. This is an exciting motivational programme. We really do hope to bring that to bear as we put together the team on which success will be built. The infrastructure program I've mentioned here is a real challenge, and of course we need to focus on that. We need to find a host community. In the next three years or so, we expect to select a site for STEP, clearly subject to consenting. It should be very clear. This would likely go through a national consenting regime, and everything will depend on permissions. We hope to pick that site. And at that site, we envisage a global hub for fusion expertise, just like Cullum. This industry, this sector, could have a phenomenal impact. And I'll talk a moment in a moment about that. And we believe that building a hub of capability around our site and around Cullum will enable that. The type of industry we need to grow, we need to be sleek, agile, responsive, customer focused. We can't get locked in an idea of what we think is best. We have to deliver something based, the phrase we use in industry is stakeholder requirements. What is required of this product? What is required of this program to be successful? We need to avoid thought constraint. We need to start here with an open mind, be completely up to speed with the best practice, the best understandings, how to optimise the design and then the delivery of energy infrastructure. We need to become part of our host community, completely part. Um, anyone who's worked in big industrial sites within a community understands that you can't sit there and just be a good neighbour. You have to be instinctively and fundamentally part of that community. And that will be essential for STEP. One that matters a great deal to me, we must be a modern, respectful, 
diverse industry. We need to access the best talent we can from every sector of society, and bring that together. We need to value diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, because this is the way in which we're gonna crack the big challenges that we'll face. And of course, regulation, safety is a priority, it must always be, but we have to recognize that Fusion doesn't have the same risk profile as many other technologies and things need to be proportionate to that. Prize of success. Potential share for the UK of multi-trillion pound market. The culmination of 50 years plus of public investment in Fusion by the UK and elsewhere. We believe our learnings will benefit other programmes in Fusion and in parallel sectors. We want to see spillover benefits. We want to see the understandings we develop help the energy sector and beyond. We want the knowledge, capabilities, skills and facilities that we build to boost the growth in the UK of the private sector and the public fusion endeavour. And of course, we want almost limitless, low carbon, low risk, sustainably fueled, large scale, flexible electricity and energy for the latter half of this century. I said I'd talk for 20 minutes. I think I've talked for about 23. A number of ways to contact us there. I'm going to leave that on the screen. And with that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to open the Q&A and we can have uh, a real discussion. Now, this is where it gets clunky, people. I'm opening Q&A boxes and I'm trying to read them, work out the answers and talk to you all in one day. So please do forgive me if things are a little rough around the edges. I've got my post-it notes so I can think as I go. So look, working through the Q&A top to bottom, do we think that Tokamak can reach the break even? Yeah, as I say, I think we have to show that we can. I think that's the challenge we as a programme face. Um, and it's not just about breaking even, it's about being a commercially desirable product. It's designing a product that fits the right market need, and bringing that product forward in the right way, with materials that can be manufactured, with operational regimes that can be viable and desirable. Um, uh, and in that way, we can truly bring a product forward um, to market. And just pausing there and talking to my colleagues from UKA, I don't know if you're able to remove questions I've answered as I've answered them, um, or, or if you need me to do that, but uh, if you can, that would be great. Next question, do you use magnetic cores confined plasma and spherical tokamak? Um, radiation tokamak can be done. What can you do? Okay, so look, as I say at the start of this, I, my degree is not in engineering. Um, of course, the, the, the concept of a spherical tokamak is not wildly different from that of a conventional tokamak. We believe uh, the ratio could give us a better solution, and that's why we're exploring that. But of course, it's a magnetic-based system to confine the plasma. It's just as, as you'd have an ITER or in JET. Um, yeah, you're right, the costs of magnets are extremely significant. We need to make sure we're getting the right designs sourced in the right way from the right type of industry with the right materials, um, and that we increase the longevity of those, those items as far as we can. You know, anything inside a tokamak is going to suffer really significant uh, neutron exposure uh, and that's why we need to make sure that, that those internal components, those in-vessel components, not just the magnets but beyond, have the longest lifespan they can, um, A to reduce the, the, the proportionate uh, capex, sorry capital cost, but also to increase the lifespan thereby increasing your time between operational outages and also reducing as far as we can the amount of material we have to take out of the tokamak um, after use. Next one on how much comms there is between um, UKA, UKSA and ESA. Fusion energy will be a game changer with respect to man space. Um, yeah, you know what? I've got a colleague who was super knowledgeable about the potential space applications of fusion. And I'm really sad he's not sitting here next to me right now, partly because he was a great guy uh, and, and partly just because he'd be able to answer that question. I know there have been overlaps between the UKA uh, and various space agencies. I can't give you the full detail of that, but if you hit the communications email address, I'm sure they can uh, share more. Other companies have much more aggressive timescales. Yeah, fair play. Um, we understand that, you know, we, we know that there's various timescales that the companies are working to and, and really I wish them luck with those. Um, we all want to see Fusion come forward. What we've done in step is lay out a timescale and a program that we think we can deliver to meet our aims with our objectives and our funding levels. Um, I think it would be disingenuous and, and unhelpful if I were to sort of 
start talking about steps and now we need to compete we need to be first we need to be this what we need to do to show the credibility of the technology to our audiences is to deliver a strong capable program to the fastest time frame we believe is credible as it stands we believe that's bringing forward a prototype in 2040 of course if breakthroughs enable that to be accelerated that would be great um but we're really focused on on delivering that 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 time frame um which is going to be you know in itself a, a significant piece of work um it would be interesting to know your thoughts on going from master use size st to a step size st in one step versus having intermediate devices great question and this step considering a high field approach um seems like high field can reduce capex so i can certainly answer the first one straight up look you're dead right you know any big difficult sort of first of a kind or nearly first of a kind uh program has options you can you can prototype to the nth degree you can keep on prototyping you can take small incremental steps Every one of those incremental steps takes time, takes money, takes investment, takes consenting, takes permissions, takes delivery. Um, or you can look to take bigger steps. Um, and in doing so, you, you potentially get a much bigger gain, but you have a much possibly bigger challenge along the way. We believe that in this country, we've got some, some really significant knowledge based on, on obviously first jet operations, but also master you in the ST space. Um, and that, that is right and enables us to move towards a step plant, um, a step prototype plant in the right way. Um, now, I think we should be clear that, that what we're not proposing to do is to bring forward the perfect final best ever spherical tokamak that's going to produce loads of predictable energy in that first go. That's why in our mission we talk about building a prototype. Um, but we do think it's the right ambition and the right aspiration at this stage of technology maturity uh, and at this stage of policy need. Regarding the point on high field approach, um, look, candidly, I can't give you an answer to that. I'm sure we as a programme can. Uh, and again, um, I don't think we can see your contact details in the box, but if you want to pop that into the comments, uh, email address question, we'll get you an answer. Were the criteria under consideration for the host of STEP? Uh, this is a really interesting one, and, and uh, I, I'd urge colleagues, and in fact, there's another one there on citing policy, so let me just say, we will be publishing um, the process by which we expect to select a site in the not too distant future. Um, of course, the selection of site will be a matter for the Secretary of State. What we need to do is provide a recommendation um, to the SOS um, throughout this first part of, of tranche one. The, the criteria, you know, we'll publish the full detail in that process. And I don't want to dive into that too much now. Um, but if you look at it, there's there's a whole host of criteria that would be the same if we were building a football stadium or a train station or a you know water plant in that you need the right size of site um, you need the right uh, access criteria you need the right seismology um, you need the right broader capabilities you need the right industry locally um, you want links to academia and these things are fairly standard across the infrastructure there's a lot of learning from best practice we've done there then there's a number of, of more power station specific criteria um, such as water and grid connections, which would reduce the, the challenges we'd have in designing um, the plant. But look, all I can say more on that is we'll, we'll publish full details fairly soon. Um, which they'll, they'll be fully in the public domain, um, as will a Q&A on that, uh, and it'll be a very, very open and transparent process. The priority for me is finding the right site, technically, the right community uh, in terms of engagement with the programme, uh, and delivering a strong programme in terms of technical outcome, the community engagement, and the socio-economic impact that brings uh, for the region, the country, uh, and beyond. And I hope that answers those, those two questions. Uh, what ways is focus for talking about economic advantage as opposed to a toroidal talking about? The key point here that the, the technical colleagues briefed me on is the, um, the magnetic field, the, the potential efficiency rating you can get from your magnetics. It's something we think is, is potentially very interesting. We'll explore with MAST. We want to explore more. Um, with step but of course look you know this sector is going to explore a lot of technologies and rightly so um we as a country and an authority are still very closely involved with ETA, which is a, a conventional tokamak um and think they also have a number of very very uh important capabilities you know i think when you're in early stage industry anyone who sits there and says oh no we can completely close this down and answer the question now here's the only solution frankly that would be a, a little naive um First one and the first few will be expensive to build. I think you're right. Um, all the investment we needed for it can start to deliver any returns. 
a big sticking point for fish and plants in the UK, how would it pay for step? Should government pay for it, private enterprise or what? Um, yes, I think that question boils down to can I answer the entire financing question in one go now? Or you can't go that far. Look, yes, big infrastructure is expensive. Without a doubt, big infrastructure is incredibly expensive. Um, the return on investment and the value can be incredibly good. Um, what kind of challenge can be is quantifying um, and capturing that at the early stage when you're seeking that finance. And yeah, you're absolutely right that the new fish and plant at the gigawatt scale in the UK have struggled to secure the level of financing we need. How will it play for step? I mean, there's a number of things we are working to design with a cost conscience. You know, this is not a bring forward product at any cost type of program. This is bring forward the right product, does the right thing for the right market at the right cost program. So the first point on any financing question has to be getting that cost in at the right point. Um, in terms of the route between public and commercial financing, clearly it's going to be a very interesting area to explore. The government plays a, a front and centre role in this programme at the moment, and we've been clear that the government remains vital. Uh, and of course, an increasingly commercial aspect of the programme is important too. Um, honestly, I think trying to define the exact breakdown at this stage of technology maturity and programme maturity would be ambitious. We've got to focus right now on designing the tokamak. Um, is step using a spherical tokamak with conventional uh, low temperature superconducting contact magnets or HDS magnets? Um, sorry for the technical question. Thank you. Someone's very understanding there. No, look, um, we've not yet made a magnet technology decision. We're exploring a number of magnet options. Uh, the sort of the chief engineer on step said to me, I think it was probably within my first week on, on this program, he said to me, look, the thing with fusion is you change one thing, you change everything. Um, uh, and that's something that's been really interesting for me to watch as we've gone through the program. Um, that, you know, you can't start, this isn't Duplo, you can't bolt together this bit and that bit until you build a robot. Um, you need to look at the entire design of the robot um, and understand what component parts you need. So there's a whole range of magnet technologies that could be interesting. Obviously, HTS is an extremely exciting field, just reading about it as a, as a lay audience. Um, but it's not the only show in town and we need, to, we need to work through those options and understand how they fit with the wider design. Um, I know that sounds like a slightly political answer, but it really isn't. It's, it, it, it's the truth <laughs> as it stands. Um, what are the engineering challenges to the success of STEP? Really interesting that you've gone for the engineering challenges there and not the R&D challenges. And I think that's a good, healthy sign for sector as a whole. The, the key engineering challenge, of course, is integration. Um, uh, we've got a number of design units and research units within the programme, all highly capable. Um, all staffed by some of the best uh, in, in the business. The challenge is not to design a number of individual components, it's to define an integrated effective system. Um, and the more I study uh, the materials coming out of our integration team, our plant architecture integration and verification team, the more it's very, very clear that the challenge is bringing all of these capabilities together that work with one another um, and not having one or two sort of legs of the spider they don't quite join up. And one of the key areas where further research is needed to make STEP a success. Really interesting. I think there's, you know, there's a number of, of research areas that, that we'd look at to make STEP a success. I think the other point is how can we research to advance um, the case of STEP? If you're looking at success, it's about understanding the right plasma model. You know, one of our great people describes plasma not as the showstopper, but the show starter. And you have to bend that down. Uh, and of course, these things need design work and fundamental research to be viable. Um, uh, and we hope to bring forward a number of, of experiments in, in physical form and in silico to, uh, to deliver that. Um, 20, 20 years sounds like a long time. Is the road and length the tranches you described flexible? If investment involvement is to increase over the next decade, um, we see the timescales of project decreasing. Are you offering? Um, Look, yeah, 21 years does sound like a long time. And of course, flexibility is important in a programme. Anyone who sets out on a journey of this length, claiming they know the exact phasing perfectly and that they're not open to new information, I think would be um, making a really, really interesting error. Um, we have to be, it, it's a real balance. We have to be focused on the endpoint and driven and hold everything to schedule whilst recognising the need for uh, flexibility. Um, in the way we do things uh, and you know things like tranches programmatic mechanisms program management mechanisms of course we have to be open-minded on would increased investment 
uh, reduced time frame that we need to look at, at what the time frame was, what the investment looked like. The reality of these programs is yes, in cases you can spend more and work faster. And in other parts of the program, you have systematic constraints, be that the availability of people, um, the time it takes to do certain pieces of work uh, or other. So, you know, I don't think it's quite as clean as saying more money result quicker. Um, but of course, in some areas you can, you can look to accelerate. How can we join the program? Brilliant question, best one today. Um, look, there's a number of points here. Um, individuals, we, you know, we recruit very significantly through our, our online portal. We advertise things very, very openly. Um, I can't remember which of the more information points is best, but have a look at the website. I'm sure there's more there. Um, so individuals, we're always looking for the right talented people, as I've said. Um, corporately, we have a very significant program of supply chain engagement. Um, uh, and we, again, being a public sector body, spending public money, we advertise our opportunities live on the STEP portal uh, with the STEP procurement pipeline on gov.uk. Um, so I really do hope there's a couple of good routes there for individuals or companies to get involved. Uh, what's the trajectory for industry becoming more involved broadly in the endeavour and at a larger scale? Assuming by the endeavour you mean, mean our programme, um, we absolutely think we've, we've got a fairly high level of industry involvement already. Um, we've had a very significant number, forgive me, the number's gone, but it's in the 70s of, of companies who've worked with us just in the first year of programme, I think it's about 79. Um, what we need to see, obviously, is, is industry taking on bigger, bigger and more defined roles of that. And I think you'll see that coming out naturally through our procurement pipeline. Um, and then obviously, as we move into later tranches, there's going to be more and more need for, for capabilities. Um, one of the most interesting sort of things I've looked at since I joined this program 18 months ago was looking at capabilities mapping through the life cycle of the program and how you move from heavy R&D to early stage design, to detailed engineering design, to design finalization, into program delivery. Um, and, and each of those require different capabilities from the sector. Um, if you're going to set up a new MSc program in digital engineering, what course units should it cover in order to ensure the graduates hit the ground running the road. Um, look, I don't want to get that wrong. Um, I really don't want to get that one wrong because that sounds to me like you're, you're looking at something that could be extremely interesting. Um, add digital people. Um, you know, we have got a whole capabilities where digital fits, digital modeling, digital engineering, and I'm sure they can give you really strong advice. So please do drop an email in to the address on screen. That uh, folks from comms team looking, please send that through to me and I'll work on that with our, with our digital team. Um, a CERN, a role in UK fusion nuclear. Um, we've obviously got collaboration CERN. I don't overlap massively with CERN. Um, Nick, if you're still on, I saw you pop up in comments earlier. I don't know if you can hit an answer to that in comments because I'm sure you're far better equipped than I am to answer that question. Um, it's an exciting piece of infrastructure for sure. Um, but Nick, if you could pop an answer in the chat box, that'd be great. Thank you. Do we think fusion power will suffer any PR political issues from being associated with fission power? Oh, that's a, you know, it's a cracking question. I, I've spent a lot of my adult life working in, in fission power, right? So, so I fundamentally do believe that fission's got a crucial role to play. Um, and when I worked in fission power, what you found was that I think polls for the trade association showed something like just over 70% of, of the, the British public were supportive of fission as part of a balanced energy mix alongside renewables. And that was, probably yeah, two years out of date. Um, what you also find is that round fishing stations, round fishing infrastructure, you have huge support where you're seeing familiarity, comfort with the technology, and of course, a significant socioeconomic impact as well. Um, what you see then is further away from those sites uh, and certain communities are a concern, obviously based on the waste and on the accident scenarios that can come with that. Now look, fusion is fundamentally different from fishing. We do not have same waste profile, we do not have the same spent fuels, we do not have the same fissile materials, we don't have the same length of, of, of life in our, in our waste, and we don't have anything like the same accident scenarios. Uh, I think one of the best things ever put to me was that the fission reaction, once it started, wants to grow and the job of the plant is to contain it. A fusion reaction, once it started, wants to stop and the job of the plant is to sustain it. And I think just engaging on, on that point alone with the public will, will help. Um, Look, my, you know, I started life as a corporate communicator, and I really do believe that when you're bringing forward either a piece of infrastructure or 
uh, an industry, you need to have a frank, mature, clean dialogue with all of your audiences. You need to be open about the challenges you bring. You need to be clear about how you resolve them. I want to put that in simple lay language, not say you simplify the issue, but you speak honestly and clearly. And I believe then, and my experience told me then, your publics will usually come with you if your case is strong. And when I look at fusion, potentially limitless, large scale, low carbon energy, sustainably, sustainably fueled, with low level and very manageable legacies, low accident scenarios, I think the case is extremely strong. I think the case is in fact, in fact incredibly attractive. And therefore I believe if we have that open, honest discussion with the public, we've got a very good chance of securing sufficient support to deliver the program and indeed to be a very popular part of, of an energy mix. The challenge you raise about overlap with fission is of course a, a sort of tactical issue we'll need to address in those, in those early years. I hope that answers that. Um, question, given the focus on achieving net zero, is achieving a similar commercial viability with nuclear fusion compared to a conventional power station actually realistic? Should there be an acknowledgement that this will actually be less commercially viable, however, the achievement of net zero outweighs this? So I think, I think what's being asked there is, well, it's actually less commercially viable. Basically, is, is fusion less commercially viable than other energy technology? I mean, look, of course, at the minute, yeah, you know, we're not in a position where we can bring, um, bring products to market immediately. I think when you, when you look at the nature of, of energy technologies on, on offer to the country, um, there's a number of options. There are very tried and established, tried and well established, fairly quick to deploy, but very carbon intensive generation methods. And I think society and particularly the policy environment has decided that's not the long-term future. You've got renewables, which are a wonderful technology that have come on leaps and bounds, not just in their technical capability, but in their price point. Phenomenal progress across the last 20 years. And they will be and should be a vital part of the UK energy mix going forward. You've got nuclear fission, which provides, depending on the day, something like 20% of the UK's electricity and a vast majority of the UK's low carbon electricity has a role to play. I think where fusion sits alongside that is being an option for the future. I've talked about expanding energy demands, potentially expanding electricity demands in the latter half of this century. And we believe the case is that fusion prov provides such a capable, credible option for that period, that it's an absolute must that we investigate and research this now. And the time, effort and resource spent on, on fusion are, are very well justified against that market context. Next one, uh, I spoke a lot about the role of industry for step, how we grow UK industry to maturity needed um, to deliver a power plant or we'll step to this, we do need more stimulus health industry supports fusion. Okay, yeah, so look, you, you're right. We, we absolutely need the sector to grow alongside um, the top level programs. And let's be clear, that is not just for step to do. Step is one, one sort of stimulus and one client base. When I talked about the role of Stepper and how it sits alongside other programs. I talked about the need for a breadth of clients. And if, if you look at any industry, but efficient is an easy comparator, the more projects you've got going on at the top level, the more there's a business case for the supply chain to invest in people and equipment and training and development um, to be a supplier in, in that field. So I think as you see fusion coming forward, and let's be clear, there's some fantastic private sector projects going on as well, as, alongside other very exciting UK AA projects, and of course, ETA, um, I think there is an increasing basis of clients there who will want to work with the sector. Um, that's a strong stimulus. But look, if you, if you go back to the very core mission of UK AEA, not of STEP, but of the authority, um, growth of, of fusion in the UK with the scientific benefits, but also the economic benefits um, is key to that. Um, and I think we as an authority need to keep focusing on providing opportunities, understanding and engagement opportunities or the supply chain at every level um, to get involved here. And the reason I talk about every level, by the way, is, is there's some, you know, there's some really exciting and interesting niche SMEs in fusion who do vital work, but also when you pull back and look at the plant, a lot of it isn't necessarily fusion specific. And the barriers to entry for existing companies may not be as significant as those companies might perhaps believe when they take a look at the sector from afar.
what are the current projections on cost per megawatt will fusion be able to secure funding if solar wind drops so that we we've not done cost megawatt predictions as of yet that um, it would just be at this stage of design maturity it would be um premature for us to to try and forecast that what we're focused on is designing with a cost conscience bringing those costs down to, to the right level um and then for that would enable us to um to have the right cost cost per megawatt when it comes to it uh, and do i think we're competitive if if renewable costs continue to drop, yeah, you know, I think research after research shows that actually what what the country and the world needs is a balanced energy mix, um, a range of, of generation sources coupled with the right approach to downstream mechanisms. Um, we do need to be on a par with other technologies, but I don't think the energy market has ever been as simple as saying it's a race to the bottom to be cheapest and you know then you dominate the sector. I think it's about being at the right right price competitive. Uh, and part of that overall mix in terms of policy needs, societal needs, uh, and more. Current design status of step. There are many challenges facing ST based power plant, pipe from exhausting, tritium breeding. How can they be tackled? Will there be experiments planned for tackling the challenges? Yes, there will. Um, tackling those challenges is what we are all about. Obviously, plasma, um, heat exhausting, and things that Master U offers a lot of learnings, which are really important. Tritium breeding is, of course, something that the sector as a whole. Has looked at many times and we've got research programs underway the experiments we do that and the fact that those experiments are hardwired into design programs um, is really the essence of, of step it's overcoming these design challenges in a way that is design led but research informed um, and we think that offers us the best route to to our outcomes what's the environmental sustainable target for the project we'd like to achieve look this is this is inherently uh a sustainable program in our eyes. Now we know that what we're talking about is bringing forward large scale, low carbon energy. We know that the sustainability in design is right. You know, if you cram your design with loads of extraneous metal and concrete, your sustainability, sustainability credentials fall. Uh, and of course, we'll look at that as well when it comes to designing and developing um, the site. We haven't got a benchmark target quite in the way you frame it there, but there are a number of environmental criteria, um, both regulatory and non-regulatory, which will Will drive work as we go forward. There appears to be a lack of available instrumentation that will work in fusion environment through the neutron impact uh, and if ever been made with interested parties to develop the applications. It's a really interesting question. I would imagine that our investor component team um, would be looking at exactly these points and as I've said a number of times materials research is vital to that both to, to making sure you've got things that go in but also things that can can have the longest lifespan once in. Um, at this point of design maturity, I would imagine we're probably still tackling some of the bigger ticket items. Um, but of course, that's going to be a really significant um, package of work as we go forward. If you want more on that, I'd be delighted to link you up with our investor components um, lead, who is rather fantastic on these things. So, you know, do drop us a note through, through the contact details shared. Do you have any thoughts on how future fusion power plants can be made viable for countries who don't have the universities institutions that develop the technical skills? That is a really interesting question. Um, I think we all know that uh, to be commercially viable, but also to have the maximum environmental impact, we want to see fusion deployed as widely as possible, right? And as widely as possible is not just here in the UK. Um, Fusion is obviously very different to fission in terms of its um, requirements of safeguards and safeguarding regimes and regulatory constraints, but they are not non-existent. So I think our priority is to design a plant that works, to design a plant that's capable, but also of course to design a plant with the biggest breadth of market applicability it can have. And that would mean a plant that as far as possible can be exported and deployed uh, in areas not necessarily familiar. And of course, that would not then just give a power station, it would also provide opportunities and a stimulus for investment in skills and capabilities and growth um, in those regions, which is an added benefit. But look, yeah, we're really clear that you don't get the scale of environmental impact we want if you only deploy in areas with massive fusion academic knowledge. Does STEP have to be built on a nuclear licensed site and will it be built in the north? Fascinating. Um, no, so nuclear site licenses don't transfer with ownership. Um, so, so it would not have to go on a current nuclear license site. Will it require a nuclear site license remains to be uh, seen. The regulatory framework will have to be decided by government. Obviously, Cullum operates under a system that is HSE and Environment Agency, and therefore not nuclear site licensed. Will it be built in the north? I don't know. Um, we'll run 
a really fair and transparent process, as I've mentioned, publishing details later this year, through which we will seek candidate sites and ultimately a recommendation um, will be made and that will be a subject for Secretary of State uh, to make the final choice. Any thoughts on international collaborations concerning STEP? Um, yeah, lots. Um, you, you know, there is a need for collaborations with academia, supply chain, um, third parties, and obviously they're already global. Um, if you're looking at state to state international collaborations, I'm not quite sure whether that's where you're going with that. Um, it's not part of the current plan, but obviously Fusion's got a long and rich history of collaboration. Um, but let's be clear, it comes back to what I said, I think, in my second slide. There is no one entity that can deliver this on their own. There's no one entity that can crack this nut. We will need collaboration from academia, supply chain and beyond. And absolutely are already working to get that. Apologies for slightly cantering through these. I'm aware I've got 22 questions in only nine minutes. So um, doing the best I can. Uh, are we looking to develop a process to keep the cost of fusion minimized to ensure it's commercially viable? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we want this to be commercially viable. The key to that is in this design process. Um, we need to make sure we bring forward a, a piece of kit that works, right? Because if, you're, if your power plant doesn't produce power on a reliable, predictable, stable, informed, reliable basis, you don't, you know, you, you just can't be cost competitive. What you then need to do at the next level is try and keep the capital cost of that down and the life cycle balance of, of, of rate of return up. Um, you know, this is fairly straightforward in theory and of course extremely challenging in process and it will come down to design constraints um, uh, and, and some, some tough design decisions to be made across the next five and, and then ten years. How do we think the lack of a fusion specific regulatory body will impact design? Are there concerns that over-regulation could slow the pace of deployment? Excuse me, I'm getting what's called Zoom voice, where you talk on conference calls all day and lose your voice. Um, look, we need a clear, stable regulatory regime. That, that's obvious. Government understands that. Um, um, and of course, we are currently regulated at column by the HSE and the Environment Agency. Obviously, regulation needs to be proportionate to the scale of risk. Um, um, regulation itself is a good thing because it provides a clear operating environment. And also it gives third parties confidence in the maturity of the technology in the sector and it gives you public confidence. Um, it's about making sure, as I say, that that is the, the you know, proportionate regulation uh, in, the, in the right way. I hope that answers that. Expected output in per megawatt E, um, TBC, we have yet to confirm the detailed output in, in megawatt electric. Um, we don't expect this to be a full sort of commercial scale plant from the off. We do expect it to be uh, consented under sort of development consent order type arrangements um, and we'll work on that and I'm sure we'll have more to say as we proceed through tranche one. Um, to add to the questions, will step design process take advantage of technologies from other industries including fission to minimise the costs? If so, is there a process being developed to ensure this is learning from other industries? I mean look, yeah absolutely, nobody wants to reinvent the wheel, right? Um, there is no glamour and glory in ignoring things that have been done and are public sourced and, and well known already. I mean a lot of that happens naturally in sort of by osmosis and that you 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 appoint good people to these leads and they understand their sectors and they understand the innovations in those sectors. There's also a wealth of public domain information published by by public and private bodies um, uh, about this. Um, in terms of process to capture learning from other industries it's a really interesting question. I don't I don't think we have, there's various UK AEA wide activities to capture um, innovations and we've done a couple of smaller supply chain innovation challenges. Um, but you're right, there's something interesting there about making sure we have a, a sort of bespoke portal to make sure we're learning from the best of industry already. So I might take your question and turn it into advice um, if you'll forgive me for doing so. Um, not a question as such, but a more comment about the less quantifiable benefits of big new technologies. Won't go as far as quoting JFK. Oh, go on, go as far as quoting JFK, but it is a similar challenge that's worth doing for other reasons. Nuclear has much higher employment uh, benefit compared to renewables. Yeah, I mean, look, so, so yeah, there's a whole whole range of benefits. One of the one of the key factors of this is, is spillover technologies. We understand that the piece of work we do might be applied to step, it might be applied wider in UK AEA. We might find innovations which aid the wider sector or, or further out into completely unrelated non-energy sectors. Um, 
investment in R&D has been shown time and again, including looking at UK AA spend, to be a very positive thing that generally adds gross value add to the country. Um, we then, of course, need to capture that for our, our own aims. Nuclear has an employment benefit. Yeah, I mean, like, I, personally, I never get into technology versus technology. I don't, I don't see a win there. Ultimately, that the country will need a complete balance of energy technologies that would include fusion, fission, renewables. Uh, for the time being, it includes clearly significant component of fossil fuels as well. Um, what we need in this country is strong, capable supplies of low carbon energy and strong, capable industries that deliver them and provide UK jobs in the process. Is STEP to be a demonstration tool or a research tool? Look, STEP is a prototype, so it should demonstrate the capability and credibility of the design. It would, of course, also produce a whole package of learnings and experiment opportunities and, and, and wider knowledge. So I think, I think I'd, I'd say it's not a demo or research, it's a prototype um, in that sense. How big or small is STEP gonna be compared to ETA? Um, look, smaller is, is the starting position, complex spherical tokamak, um, and will evolve both our design and our site layout um, over the coming years. And again, to note that anything we do will be subject to full planning consent applications. Um, right, I've got about two minutes to go. Um, just to say now that if I don't get to your question, I, I'm really sorry. I promise I'm cantering as fast as, as I really can. Um, please do pop them in email and we'll get back to you um, through, our, through our corporate comms team. But for the last couple of minutes, I'll keep diving on. How details the current designs? Are there already plasma machines? I've come as we've said, it's a uh, state, state operation targeting. Um, we're at the early stage. We've been working for about 18 months of a 21 year program. So clearly the design is at a fairly early stage of maturity. Um, some aspects of the design are increasingly looking like they might be clear, um, but it'd be wrong for me to, to preempt those. And obviously there's some aspects of that that we'll, we'll keep in house whilst we're, whilst we're developing it. Um, and yeah, there's clearly a number of ways you can operate this plant, either through steady state or pulsing, uh, uh, and they both have you know, interesting attractions. Will the CE marking process be involved in step project? Look, we'll, without a doubt, we'll need um, component accreditation and supplier qualification. Um, I don't know exactly what process that will be. Codes and standards are going to be a really important part of this. But yeah, when you're building any high value energy technology, you have to make sure you guard against counterfeit um, and substandard materials and code standards and markings are one way of, of doing that. Is UK a still interested in demo? Of course, fantastically so. Um, ETA and demo are really important programs. Uh, we've still got people very much working on them. Um, we want to collaborate. They're really great, great pieces of work. STEP is, is we believe, a helpful addition to the international collaborative suite of programs. Um, in no way is it a replacement. Um, and I think that probably answers the comment below on ETA as well. As the option of smaller modular step station has been explored, with respect to rollout be useful for remote locations? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Look, we, we want to bring forward a design that has the strongest market options in it that it can. Um, look, I think it would be naive at this point, 18 months into a 21 year programme to start saying we could do this derivative, that derivative. What we need to do is, is come to a really strong concept design um, but of course, we've got people looking at what energy market is driving towards. And, and, and you know, you can see clearly in fission space that smaller modular plant is, is currently viewed as in some ways more attractive. Um, we want STEP to be as deployable as possible um, is the most honest thing I can say at this stage of, of maturity. Ask me the question again in 10 years, and, I, and I'd love to, to hopefully be able to tell you where we are on, on the core design and derivative designs also. Um, can you please recap the alternative use of STEP other than power generation? Um, look, there's a whole range of ways STEP could be deployed. Um, so the STEP plant will, will be the demonstrator, the prototype, it will prove the principles of the design. But obviously, um, there's a number of other uses. So power generation is one, um, be that for electricity, for hydrogen. And then you've got non-power uses like you know, medical isotopes and things which are worth exploring and are very interesting as well. Um, the priority now is to understand design, understand what we can bring forward um, and research the market applications which might be possible. Look folks, I'm, you know, I hate leaving 10 questions unanswered but it is 2.30, we are at the end of our time slot there. Um, please, please do pop them in, um, communications at ukaa.uk. Um, you can follow us on all the social channels as well and find us on our website 
Um, just thanks for taking the time. Um, you know, over 100 people have stayed with me for an hour, which is, is really kind of you all. Um, and I hope we get to speak, work together and, and talk again in the not too distant future. So thanks very much, folks. Have a great afternoon. Take care.